Good morning, everyone. I hope you have your warm sweater on and your turtleneck wherever you are, because in my basement this morning, it's pretty cold. John Marshall for the Rouge Center for the Cure of GI Cancers. And I'm really delighted to be kicking off our third day, our Saturday morning uh, portion of our 13th annual Rouge Center Symposium. Um, and as you know, we've already had a deep dive into the science of yesterday. We had our luminaries event earlier Thursday evening, which was spectacular, which featured some of our own science from within uh, Georgetown and Lombardy. But this morning, we're going to kick off our so-called patient day with a kind of hybrid presentation focused for me as a clinician, as well as those patients who are interested uh, in the space of what we call neuroendocrine cancers. And so let me just welcome you on behalf of the entire faculty and everybody who has been participating uh, in this, uh, uh, both uh, as a speaker and faculty, as well as uh, those who've signed in. We've had nearly 300 registered for the uh, week's events, um, and we're really hopeful that uh, this has been impactful for all of you who've participated. I wanna give a particular shout out to our sponsors who have helped support everything that we have been doing. And for those of you who've logged in, you know that where we are starting is in the world of neuroendocrine cancers. And these are uh, an incredibly interesting group of diseases which um, affect many more people than you might think. And we are lucky enough to be surrounded by experts in the field. However, I will tell you that the order in which we are going to present this morning is a little different from the original program because of some internet issues for one of our speakers. So Dr. Jadiro Del Rivero, who is not only a terrific friend, but an incredible colleague um, at the National Cancer Institutes, um, has agreed to kind of switch the order a little bit. So we're going to let her uh, start our program by giving us an overview of current medical treatments uh, for uh, neuroendocrine tumors. So Dr. Del Rivio, the Rivero, the internet is yours. Great. Thank you so much. Can you hear me? Can you hear me all? We hear you fine. Perfect. Thank you so much. First, I would like to Thank you all and Dr. Marshall for the kind invitation. And I'm really grateful uh, to be with you all today. And of course, the organizers as well for putting all this amazing conference. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to discuss now about the current medical management of neuroendocrine tumors. Uh, just to start, the incidence of neuroendocrine tumors is increasing over the last few uh, decades. We can see here on the uh, blue uh, line that does all other solid tumors like breast cancer, colon cancer. But you can see here on the orange line that the incidence has increased for the neuroendocrine tumors. And you may ask, why is that? One of the reasons why we think there is an increase in incidence is because we have now better diagnostic tools such as the colonoscopy, endoscopy, at the same time now with the dot of the scan, the nuclear medicine scan that Dr. Giuseppe Esposito will discuss is help us also to have better diagnosis in terms of, and, and also management of these neuroendocrine tumors. We can also see that the incidence of neuroendocrine tumors is also increasing by um, um, a site as well. So this is the different sites of neuroendocrine tumors. And we can see that the incidence of blonde, um, stomach, like small intestine has already increased, but overall, all the types of neuroendocrine tumors, which can be anywhere in the body, has also increased as well. Now, uh, let's discuss a little bit about the grading and classification of neuroendocrine tumors. So we have the well-differentiated uh, neuroendocrine tumors, which it can be anywhere from grade one to grade three. Um, well-differentiated neuroendocrine tumor uh, of grade one, K67 is less than 3%. And just for our patients who is listening today, the K67 is a proliferation index. It tells me how the cells are able to divide under the microscope. Uh, then we have the grade two neuroendocrine tumor, K67 is three to 20%. Um, well differentiated grade three, there's now a new terminology for the neuroendocrine tumors where the K67 is greater than 20%, but usually less than uh, 50%. And the reason why I'm saying this is because well differentiated grade three is treated a little bit different to what we used to know in the past that used to be treated as neuroendocrine 
neuroendocrine carcinoma. A neuroendocrine carcinoma is more aggressive tumors. They grow more rapidly. They have a little bit of a dismal prognosis. And KS67 there is usually greater than 50%. Now, well differentiated neuroendocrine tumors, though that they skinned is positive, they keep they have expression of the matsatin receptors, and we're going to discuss more about that. Whereas they once they start to progress and they start to be more aggressive, they lose the somatostatin receptors and become FDG or glucose skin avid. Now we discuss the neuroendocrine tumors can be anywhere in the body. Most of the neuroendocrine tumors are non-functional or non-secreting, meaning that uh, they don't secrete hormones. Approximately 30% or less of these tumors, especially in the pancreas, may secrete hormones. Um, and depending on what cell is affected in the pancreas, they have a specific hormone that they produce. And based on what hormones they produce, they have specific symptoms as well. We can see here on the bottom the different hormones that is produced in the pancreas, uh, like gastrinoma, insulinoma, uh, glucagonoma. Those are more rare neuroendocrine tumors, uh, but we have seen uh, as well those in, in subset of pancreas neuroendocrine tumors. And a lot of these functional neuroendocrine tumors in the pancreas has also been in the setting of a multiple endocrine neoplasia type 1. Um, most of the small intestine neuroendocrine tumors produces serotonin, and because of that, these patients can develop carcinoid syndrome. But for us, it's important to know whenever we have a functional neuroendocrine tumors, because it can also help us to determine what we need to do in order to treat the symptoms. Um, now, uh, neuroendocrine tumors are heterogeneous. Uh, what that means is that is every patient may have a different clinical presentation, and the tumors may behave a little bit different as well. For me, as a treating physician, what I need to know is what is extension of disease, meaning if it's a small volume disease versus a large volume disease, whether it's only localized in the liver or whether it's outside the liver, because that's when we can have different treatment options as well for these patients. Whether it's a stable, neuroendocrine tumors well differentiated, they're slow growing and our patients can live a long life too. Uh, whether they're progressive too, and what does that mean for us and what we need to do and how we can help make the diagnosis as well. We also need to know where is the neuroendocrine tumor coming from. I say earlier, some of these tumors may be functional, but also based on what site it is, it can also, we also have a different treatment algorithm for these patients. We discuss about the well differentiated grade one to grade three neuroendocrine tumor versus the poorly differentiated, where it's more aggressive. Um, and uh, whether we discuss some of the hormone status, functional, non-functional, and also we discuss briefly about whether the tumors can express the somatostatin receptors versus not, because based on that, then we have not only a diagnostic tool, but also treatment modality as well. Um, so treatment of landscape of neuroendocrine tumors has, uh, we have seen a, a lot of progression lately. As you can see here in the 1980s, 1990s, we didn't have that treat many treatment options, but it has been in the last decade where we have seen different treatment options for these tumors. And that for our patients, whenever we see this, it makes me feel hopeful because now we have other treatment options that we can then improve. Uh, recommend to our patients. And still, the question is, what is the sequencing? Because sometimes we don't know uh, what will be the sequence in certain situations, like for breast cancer or other solid tumors, we know what to do for a first line, second line, or third line. But for neuroendocrine tumors, it's still we we don't have the sequencing, meaning that it's not like one size fits all. You know, we really need to understand the whole patient. And, and as we discussed earlier, what is the tumor presentation? If it's low growing, rapidly growing, whether it's localized in one area versus not. So we really need to discuss this patients in a, with a multidisciplinary team to for that to be able to help us, what will be the best treatment options. Uh, whenever I'm discussing these uh, cases with my fellows, I always ask my fellow, uh, you know, what do we need to do for symptom control, especially for those functional tumors, whether it's in the pancreas or coming uh, from the small bowel port causing carcinoid syndrome, and also what we need to do for tumor control. There is two things that they always need to, need to take in consideration. And the reason why is because there can be many different treatment options as well. And a lot of these agents not only helps to control the symptoms, uh, related to the excess hormone, but it can also help to control the hormone tumor growth, or it can also only 
uh, help control the tumor growth. As we can see, we have different treatment options, and we're going to discuss more in detail about this. And of course, we have our experts here, nuclear medicine physician, Dr. Giuseppe Pasita, as well as our intervention radiologist, who is going to describe more in detail when do we can use these different um, options. Uh, first, let me discuss with you about somatostatin agonists. Which one are those? Uh, these are landriotai or um, um, octriotai or uh, uh, some sandostatin. That's another name for that. And where this came from? So we, uh, in, it was back in the 2009 where the first study with the PROMET uh, was um, uh, discussed. Uh, where uh, patients that had functional neuroendocrine tumors, uh, they were given to these somatostatin agonists, and they saw that not only helps to control the symptoms, but it also has a benefit on progression-free survival. And for our patients, what is progression-free survival is how the uh, how is stabilization of disease, uh, the time of stabilization of disease, or the time to tumor progression. Um, and that's uh, what we saw initially with these agents, with the sandostatin. It has a benefit on progression-free survival, meaning it stabilizes the tumors. And we saw that the patients that were on landriotide has a longer progression-free survival compared to the patients that were in the placebo too. In the landriotide, uh, that's another, we saw also as well that there was a benefit on progression-free survival. Now, more in detail, you know, we have the data from the sandostatin and we have the data, as we can see here, for the landriotide. Uh, as we can see here, the patients that were included into the studies were a little bit different because in the sandostatin, it was only mid-gut neuroendocrine tumors, where the landriotide, there were other neuroendocrine tumors, such as the pancreas, hangout as well. Uh, most of the tumors uh, included on the sandostatin study were functional, whereas the clarinet were not functional. Um, so there is a difference in terms of patients, um, um, uh, how they did the studies. However, whenever I, I, my patient asks me like which one is better, there is really not head-to-head -head comparison to really help us understand whether one is better than other. We always say it's the same because both of them helps to decrease uh, not only the symptom control related to the hormone excess, but also helps as well to slow down the growth of the tumor. But this is just for you to give you a difference between the two of them based on what the studies were made. And, and, and again, sometimes, if a patient may have a larger volume disease, whether we can use uh, uh, landriotide before sandostatin, there's still a possibility based on the options. However, again, just to clarify, there is no benefit. There is no head-to-head -head comparison to determine if one is better than the other. Now, we discussed earlier about carcinoid syndrome. Carcinoid syndrome is a series of symptoms related to the small bowel neuroendocrine tumors. Um, and most common symptoms associated with the uh, carcinoid syndromes are flushing, uh, diarrhea, and some of these patients that have this excess of carcinoid syndrome or these symptoms may have anywhere from three to four bowel movements to more, you know, like 15, 16. And that's really very uh, difficult for our patients as well, because they can have a good quality of life. But now we have certain measurements that we can implement in those situations, and we're going to discuss more about that. It can and also uh, cause um, valve dysfunction, uh, heart um, as, as well, because these uh, hormones can also accumulate into the heart valve. And because of that, it can cause carcinoid heart disease. Every patient that has excess serotonin need to also be evaluated by cardiologists and have an echocardiogram anywhere from uh, one to two years. Uh, there is really no guidelines of how often we need to do it, but our recommendations is that any patient that have this excess of serotonin and related to the carcinoid syndrome needs to also be seen by a cardiologist. Uh, it can also have other symptoms such as swelling as well, of uh, edema, um, uh, myopathy, meaning mus uh, pain in the muscles as well, and there's other um, arthralgias as well, and there's other symptoms that can be associated with carcinoid syndrome. Another question that I usually get from patients is like if there is anything that can exacerbate those symptoms, and that's why the knowledge about the five uh, E's, like uh, the use of aiding certain foods can make exacerbate those symptoms, um, uh, uh, emotions too, of a significant amount of stress, like ethanol, exercise, 
as well as epinephrine whenever um, we have some dental work. And it's important that you need to discuss with the patients. That said, I usually don't try to uh, avoid the, any of those things. I think it's important that you know, because usually the symptoms that may cause is flushing than anything else. But if you feel uh, that uh, this is the case, just, just need to acknowledge and maybe avoid those, um, uh, uh, those foods or alcohol at the same time. I think sometimes, I mean, I don't try to prevent my patients from doing that. I mean, you can try a little bit and that cause any symptoms don't do it anymore. But at the same time, you know, sometimes, you know, if somebody want to have a specific food or a glass of wine, I think it's okay. As long as we acknowledge that and we acknowledge the symptoms as well. Some of my patients may require a little bit of short acting uh, injections in those situations, but there's something to keep in mind. It's gonna, I always tell my patients, knowledge is power and it's something that we learn as well. Um, so as I say earlier, sandostatin or landriotide can help for the symptoms of diarrhea and all the symptoms of uh, flushing related to the carcinoid syndrome. But uh, as in some patients that we have, like the diarrhea doesn't get better uh, despite uh, uh, um, given the injections because you, the sandostatin and the landriotide injections are every four weeks. Uh, but sometimes we recommend every three weeks to help with the um, symptoms, but it's that's not helping this use despite using, you know, the injections every three weeks or then every four weeks and also the short acting version as well. Uh, we call those the rescue shots. This puzzle of that, if we don't see that the symptoms uh, of diarrhea is, is improving, then there is a medication called telotristat, uh, the brand name for this is Sermelo. And basically what the last type does, it's inhibit the rate limited enzyme that converts tryptophan to serotonin. And serotonin, the way we measure serotonin, it can either be in the blood, but also in the urine as well. And that's what, when we say about the levels of 5-HIAA, uh, which is basically the breakdown of serotonin. So the lottery side inhibit that rate limited enzyme from that conversion. And this was approved for uh, carcinoid um, uh, syndrome diarrhea. That's the only indication that we have it and we recommend it as well. As we can see here from the data, not only the lotrisa helps to decrease the, um, the levels of uh, urine by HIAA, but also the, the frequency of how many episodes of diarrhea has decreased as well by the use of this drug. And it's something, another kind of like a, a drug in our uh, toolbox of different treatments that we can use as well and consider them in certain situations. Um, so let's just discuss a little bit about the mTOR pathway, which we uh, is um, the name that we use for the treatment or, ha or has been approved by the FDA for the management of neuroendocrine tumors is Everolimus. Everolimus not only is recommended for pancreas neuroendocrine tumors, but that as well for um, um, the uh, small bowel neuroendocrine tumors and not neuroendocrine tumors. So we can see here that there is a benefit of this drug, Everolimus, and and progression free survival, meaning slow down the uh, growth of the tumors. Um, and uh, and that was for both pancreas as well, for extra pancreatic, meaning small bowel, as well as for long neuroendocrine tumors. But in the overall uh, survival of anything, we didn't see it as benefit. However, on the radiant four, which is again for small bowel and for lungs, there was a decrease on the or reduction of the um, um, incident of death by 35%. Now let's discuss about sunetinib. Uh, sunetinib is a tyrosine kinase inhibitor. Uh, for our patients, this tyrosine kinase, they, uh, they block the blood vessel supply going into the tumor. The one that was approved or is approved by the FDA and that's mainly for pancreas neuroendocrine tumors is sunetinib. Uh, as we can see from the data of sunetinib, there is also a benefit and progression for survival of 11.4 months compared to placebo 5.4 months. As we can see here in our uh, table here, uh, there was different responses as well, uh, sunetinib versus placebo. And what we have seen uh, also with these agents is that sometimes the response rate, meaning how these drugs are able to shrink the tumors is not as high, but uh, the reason why is our, our toolbox is because it's, it's, it's proven to slow down the growth of the tumors. There are other different targeted therapies for neuroendocrine tumors. We can see a list of them. Uh, we have other uh, uh, um, drugs as well in the family of the tyrosine kinase inhibitors, such as surfatinib, pasopanib, axitinib, cabosantinib, and lenvatinib. The one that is 
uh, ongoing in the clinical trial is cabosantinib. Uh, the name of this, the study is the cabinet study. The Dr. Um, uh, Jennifer Chen is the lead uh, PI of the study. Uh, we also uh, had the study with Pasapani. Now the results will be reporting as well. And sulfatinib, um, sulfatinib, uh, we uh, the uh, it was submitted to the FDA by approval, but then it was in the beginning of this year that the FDA didn't approve it because initially when the Chinese did the study, there was a different patient population to what we have here. We were a little disappointed because that was another drug that we can use also for our toolbox, especially for the small bowel neuroendocrine tumors, which we don't have as many treatment options as we have seen for pancreas neuroendocrine tumors. But there are still ongoing studies as well because we saw from the data that there was a benefit of this tyrosine kinase for different type of neuroendocrine tumors. Um, Dr. Esposito will go more in detail about this, um, but we know that the dot of the scan is the most sensitive scan for functional assessment of the well-differentiated neuroendocrine tumors. Uh, we're using two of them, is the, either the 68 gallium dot of the scan versus the 64 uh, copper dot of the scan. So the two of them, in terms of sensitivity, my understanding is the same. Dr. Esposito will discuss more about that. The half-life is different because the 68 gallon dot of the scan half-life is much shorter, about an hour, where the half-life of 64 copper dot of the scan is longer, about 12 hours. And the reason why I'm saying this is because sometimes if we do the dot of the scans, we know that has to be done within a certain time, where the 64 copper dot of the scans, it's some, like I say, half-life is within 12 hours. And even if you're late for your appointment or so, you still are able to do the dot of the scan. Uh, we can see the difference between the functional image and modalities. We uh, octreta is the is the scan that we used to do used in the past years ago. Um, and we can see that the sensitivity, in, meaning how we're able to detect the tumors, is much better with the copper or the gallium dotted scans compared to the octreotide scan. And this is just an example of how the lesions are able to see much better, more well de delineated on the either gallium or copper dotted scan. Now, Dr. Spacida will discuss more about this, but this is just kind of like the concept of teranostics. So what teranostics means is uh, diagnostic and uh, therapeutics. So diagnostics, therapeutics, and diagnostics. So meaning that we have a diagnostic tool. In this case, it could be uh, gallium dotted skin, but it can also be other ones. Like we have now the PSMA as well for prostate cancer. We have the I-123 scans for thyroid cancer. We have the MIVG scan for pheochromocytomas and paraganglioms. But when we have a tool, a diagnostic tool that help me understand what is the, uh, uh, the um, um, in terms of the volume of disease that we see on the tumor, then we have a treatment that targets the same receptor. And here with our patients, just for our patients who are listening to um, uh, this talk, uh, is like Dr. Kuhn, Pamela Kuhn, so which is this analogy of the um, a lock and key uh, analogy, meaning that we have the lock, which is basically the receptor that is found on the surface of the tumor cells, in this case is the somatostatin receptors, and then you have the key, which is your target, your ligand, and then it goes to the receptors. And then once you do that, there is going to be a series of defense by doing that. Um, so that's, as I say, this is, we have the diagnostic, and then we have the treatment, and that's the concept of teranostic. Now, uh, and Dr. Esposito will discuss more about that. Now, this is, we have the, uh, 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 a, uh, uh, treatment approved by the FDA, which is called Luthathera, and that was based on the Netherlands study. And we can see here the uh, significant progression-free survival when the studies was reported. Um, so that's on, on your um, left uh, side, we have the graph. Uh, of the progression-free survival. And as a medical oncologist, that's what we like to see, the suppression of the lines that help us understand more about the benefit of these agents. Uh, but it was reported on the ESMO of this, oh, 2021, that even though initially they saw a benefit on overall survival, then when they did the five-year analysis and follow-up, they didn't see that there was a benefit on overall survival. And then when you ask to the, uh, to the um, authors and uh, the lead investigators as Jonathan Strathford, Dr. Jonathan Strathford, why uh, this happened. And it's maybe because it wasn't power for overall survival, or also a lot of these patients that were enrolled on the 
uh, on the uh, high dose uh, Sandoz that and it, there was evidence of disease progression. They went cross over to the um, other uh, uh, arm of the study, which that may be another reason why this crossover bias that we didn't see the benefit that we wanted to see for overall survival. That say we know that lethal therapy is affected for neuroendocrine tumors, and now where the science is going is like we could we make this agent more effective, and that's why now there is combination treatments with lethal therapy as well. And we can discuss more about this. And once we discuss about clinical trials, uh, the other agent that we use is gefcitabine temozolomide. This is a chemotherapy pill. This is the uh, this is an in, uh, the indication to use temozolomide and gefcitabine is for pancreas neuroendocrine tumors. But something that I want to show you is that this agent really has the highest response rate compared to other uh, treatments. So that's why we need to understand more about pancreas neuroendocrine tumors and what is the uh, growth in order to determine whether this agent could be adequate for our patients. The um, um, uh, survival benefit was similar between the two arms, but we saw higher response rate on the mesolamide um as well. And it was in this year during the ASCO meeting that they, they also look at the MGMT uh, expression, either by immunostochemistry or by promoter methylation as well. And what they saw is like the, there was MGMT deficiency, either seen by immunostochemistry or by, like I said, promoter methylation. It was associated with higher response rate. So that's something to think about. It could be also considered a, a prognostic biomarker, I'm sorry, predictive biomarker of response. So take home points for the GI nets is that first line treatment for well differentiated small bowel neuroendocrine tumors is SSA, either sandostatin or landriotide. If there is evidence of disease progression, then either 68 gallium or six, uh, 64 copper dot to scan a positive PRT with the there is an option if it's negative then everolimus. That said, you know, because this is a rare disease, clinical trials is also something that can be considered, and we discuss more about that. Lembatin is another option that can be used uh, based on the data of response with lembatin for GIs, but also for pancreas neuroendocrine tumors. Now for the pancreas neuroendocrine tumors, first line is SSA, sandostatin alandriotide. Is there is evidence of disease progression with large volume or symptomatic? We discuss about the response rate, meaning the radiographic response, how the tumors are able to shrink with specific therapy with capsidabin temozolomide. If there is a, a moderate volume functional tumors uh, and they are avid on either a, a copper or gallium dot scan, PRT will lose a therapy will be an option. Dr. Sposito will discuss more about that. If there is disease progression after lutathera or capsidabin, those are other options that we discuss, like lymphatinet, sunitinet, clinical trials, everolimus. Now, we're going to discuss very briefly in the next few minutes about what clinical trials we have available for well-differentiated neuroendocrine tumors, and this is just a very selective studies. One is the NEDER2. So the nether two, we have the nether one, well differentiated neuroendocrine tumors, K67 less than 10%. And then we have the nether two, where patients are included much, with much higher neuroendocrine tumor. These patients are randomized to either get the luthathera, as it, similarly to the nether one, for doses of luthathera given every eight weeks or uh, a high dose of sandostatin. And the primary endpoint of the study or what the question the study would like to answer is a progression-free survival or time to tumor progression. Uh, other endpoints, secondary endpoints are um, uh, objective response rate, how the tumors are able to shrink using this agent, quality of life, as well as overall survival. Now, the other study is the COMPETE study. This is a different form of the uh, uh, luthathera. It's called 177-lutitionate.triotide uh, in patients with gastroenteropancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. Uh, this is, uh, this is a, a study that I'm looking forward for the results because this is uh, it, it's a comparison with another active agents. In this case, it's the verolimus. Usually, most of the studies that, has, that we know until now that they led to the approval by the FDA of different agents is either investigational drug and long acting uh, sandostatin or investigational drug or uh, placebo. So, this is another study that I'm looking forward to the results because mm -hmm. it's also a, a, another active studies as well. Uh, progression, primary endpoint of the study is progression free survival um, and our time to tumor progression. And secondary endpoints of the, stu uh, the studies is uh, objective response rate and overall survival. And again, these are the numbers, NCT and study numbers, if you would like to look um, forward into these studies.
Um, there is another one I'm also excited about the study. This is the nether P study. So the nether P is again, Luthathera is given also four cycles um, uh, every eight weeks. Uh, this is, but this, this study is for pediatric patients, age 12 to 18, either for gastric and pancreas, pancreas, neuroendocrine tumors, but as well for patients with pheochromocytomas and paraganglioma's. Patients with pheopara, uh, more than 95% of these tumors express this receptor. So it makes sense that this uh, agent can be used as well and to help us understand what is efficacy as well on this tumor type. But is overall for any tumors that express somatostatin receptor. This is a multi-center study. So there are a, a few centers in the United States that they have this study open. Uh, University of Kentucky, my friend, Dr. Aman Shahan is the one who sees those patients, pediatric. He's also a pediatric oncologist as well. Um, and then primary end point is to understand what is the radiation doses in the organ, as well as to understand the safety and tolerability of this agent. Now, another study that I think I'm also very excited is, uh, a, is, a, is Luthathera for bronchial neuroendocrine tumors. We didn't discuss today about the bronchial neuroendocrine tumors, which is another type of neuroendocrine tumors that is uh, we often see as well. Um, and this is led by Dr. Thomas Hope and Dr. Suki Pada. Uh, and uh, there is not approved for bronchial neuroendocrine tumors. Even we think that there may be a benefit, it's not approved. And this is, they just opened the study. So I'm very excited that the, I can see this is another option for our patients with long neuroendocrine tumors. Primary endpoint of the study is, is progression-free survival, and secondary endpoint is objective response rate and overall survival. So this is a study that's open and currently accruing. The other patient is led by my friend, my good friend, Dr. Aman Shahant. This is a, a phase one study of triapine in combination with Luthathera. As I say earlier, we know that Luthathera works for neuroendocrine tumors, but can we give something more effective for the, our patients? And that's why combination treatments is what uh, we have seen now. At the NIH, we have a Luthathera in combination with a Lamprep, but then Dr. Shahant is also doing a combination with, in, 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 uh, Luthathera in combination with triapine, which is, also, is quality radio sensitizer to make luthathera more effective. But also one other one other um, hypothesis of why we wanted to do this combination, because we also have that available at the NIH, is because luthathera is a type of radiation treatment. So when we give that radiation treatment, it causes uh, uh, DNA breaks. And sometimes the cell is going to try to repair itself. And when that happens, it can make the treatment not as effective or resistant to the treatment. So if we can give something to block that repair. That's what we think it may be more effective. We, we have this uh, drugs in the DNA repair um, innovation families, such as Olaprep is one of them that has been used for breast cancer, prostate cancer, and so forth, as well as triapine is another DNA repair inhibitors, mm -hmm. and it's currently accruing as well. Uh, so the alpha, I'm sure Dr. Sposito will discuss about the alpha PRT, and the alpha PRT, has, we have seen very exciting results. Dr. Delpasan discussed the results currently. Our NANET's meeting was here in D.C., a month ago, and I think the data seems quite promising. So that's now undergoing um, a phase of three results. And just to let you know, uh, this is something that most likely Dr. Sposito will discuss, but we feel that with these uh, alpha emitters, it's going to be less collateral damage compared to the other ones. It's an alpha radiation compared to Luthera, which is a VEDA, and Dr. Sposito will discuss more about that. I discussed briefly about the cabinet study. This is a cabosantin study led by Dr. Jennifer Chain in the family of the tyrosine kinase inhibitors that blocks the blood vessel supply going into this tumor. It's a, it's a, um, it's a, a, a randomized double blend uh, placebo control, but the patients are randomized to three, uh, so it's a three, two to one, meaning that of the three patients, two will get treatment, but if there is any um, um, any progression of disease on the placebo, they can then receive open label cabosantinib and they follow those patients as well for pancreas as well for a small bowel neuroendocrine tumors. Primary endpoint is progression free survival. So uh, just very briefly, about the, it's only two studies about the poorly differentiated neuroendocrine tumors or the neuroendocrine carcinoma. Uh, another friend of mine, Dr. Sadia Das, he's at the his Vanderbilt has this study of a topistomerase inhibitor, which is a um, 
uh, a, a, a chemotherapy as well in combination with an agent um, that is called Bay 1895344. Um, sorry for the long name, but and that's an, uh, also under study and that's for patients with a small, uh, a small cell lung carcinoma as well for poorly differentiated neuroendocrine tumors. The reason why they want to combine the two of them is similarly to the analogy that I say before, you have a type of chemotherapy causing a break and then you add another drug to make it more, more effective. Ongoing as well, multicenter. And, and another study is cabozantinib in combination with nevo and ipilimumab for poorly differentiated neuroendocrine carcinoma. This is an immunotherapy uh, type of uh, treatment. Um, so that's another question that my patient uh, has, like when immunotherapy can be indicated for our patients. We know poor well differentiated. We have done study, doesn't really see the efficacy that we see as for the poorly differentiated neuroendocrine carcinomas. But this is something that helps understand more about the efficacy of the swell of this tumor. And lastly, this is my last slide, is about that the NIH uh, has a neuroendocrine neoplasia, neuroendocrine tumor therapeutic programs. We have two natural history study, one for neuroendocrine tumors as well. We also include adrenocortical carcinoma as well as for pheochromocytoma sparing gliomas. Natural history study helps us understand the biology of these tumors over time because we follow patients long term. And then we have active clinical studies, one for Luthathera on Luthathera only for pheochromocytomas and paragangliomas, and Luthathera in combination with a laparid for gas and pancreas neuroendocrine tumors. We have other studies for pheochromocytomas and paraganglia, but, but moreover, we have developed a, a multidisciplinary team that has an extensive knowledge about neuroendocrine tumors, and we also welcome any patients to be seen either as a consultation or be considered by one of, of our studies. With that, I would like to thank you all for your attention. This is my email and contact info if you want to get in touch with me. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, uh, uh, and uh, um, so, um, and again, I apologize for the internet problems, uh, connection problems that we were having before. Um, uh, and again, I'd like to, to thank all the participants to this uh, session. Um, my um, um, my uh, focus is going to be uh, for this presentation on the, what is the role of imaging and uh, um, imaging to the, to um, uh, prepare the patient to select the patient for radionuclide treatment in patients that have a neuroendocrine tumor to the gastrointestinal tract and the pancreas. Um, let's see. Um, so this is my title slide, um, and I will uh, um, to in. Uh, um, as you can see uh, from this slide, uh, we have uh, different imaging uh, tools uh, for the evaluation of patients with uh, uh, neuroendocrine tumors. Um, we usually, most of the times, the patient when there is a, a suspicion for a neuroendocrine tumor or with uh, um, known a neuroendocrine tumor, maybe because they had to have a surgery because of uh, uh, bowel obstruction, that's one way the neuroendocrine tumors often present. Well, then the first imaging modality is usually either the CT or MRI, as you can see on the left side of the screen. Um, and, uh, uh, and CT and MRI uh, are great because they allow us to look at the structure, the size of the abnormalities of the lesions, the vascularization of the tumors. Uh, and that's imp very important for the surgeon as well to assess whether the, um, the tumor can be resected or not. Uh, so overall, the CTM and I give us uh, a very good idea, uh, a very good characterization of, uh, the, um, of the anatomy of the tumor um, and uh, a very good initial staging. Um, uh, also, they're very uh, valuable for a follow-up and restaging of patients that are undergoing treatment. Um, and then we have uh, uh, what is a little bit closer to me as I'm, I'm a nuclear medicine physician, uh, what we kind of uh, think of as uh, a functional imaging or molecular imaging in a way. And we have um, different possibilities. Um, historically, we were using octreotide spec CT uh, for the characterization of neuroendocrine tumors. 
um, in the last few years, uh, that has mostly been replaced by PET CT imaging, so DOTA PET uh, CT imaging. And what we do with that, we target the uh, somatostatin receptors. Um, and somatostatin receptors, which are expressed on the neuroendocrine tumors, most of the neuroendocrine tumors, not all of them. And what, we, uh, what a PET CT allows us to do is uh, to um, characterize the tumor, the biology of the tumor, a stage of the disease, and also guide uh, um, the treatment, uh, possible treatment with some of uh, the uh, um, uh, targeted radionuclide treatments that we have. Um, but not all uh, the uh, neuroendocrine tumors express the somatostatin receptors. And so we also uh, have different techniques and still within a PET-CT, we have FCG PET-CT, which essentially uh, looks and visualizes the, the metabolic activity of the tumors. Um, we'll see later how sometimes the neuroendocrine tumors, again, can be quite different one another or even within the same patient, or they can transform themselves. And so they change their biology and they increase their metabolic activity. And the FPG PET that uh, tags the, uh, the um, metabolic activity may be a better option in some of these patients. So the goal of imaging in neuroendocrine tumors in general is, again, initial evaluation, initial staging of the patient. So to see um, if the tumor is just one side uh, or uh, whether there are multiple sites of uh, disease, so if there's metastatic disease. Uh, so again, that's very important for surgical planning uh, and uh, uh, assess the overall tumor burden and by the, uh, characterize the biology of the tumor. So I said that CT and MRI are very important. So you can see here the arrows um, here pointed to different lesions in the liver both in, uh, on the left, kind of an actual view, and then a coronal view, as we say. So there, the, the, definitely the CT and MRI can show us uh, the number of the deletions. And then you can see down on the right side, the figure on the right side with a black arrow, uh, that is the primary tumor um, with the liver metastasis. Um, this is a tumor uh, of uh, the small bowel. It's a carcinoma tumor of the small bowel. You can see multiple uh, white arrows there. Uh, in the different uh, pictures, uh, and those point to different sites of the tumor within the small bowel. It is not uh, unusual to see multiple sites of the carcinoid tumor within the small bowel, and CT and MRI are quite good to identify all those uh, lesions. But uh, we know that DOTA tape PET CT is actually quite accurate on overall, um, probably more accurate than the CT or MRI herself. But the, la the way I would like to see is that imaging, these imaging modalities, they complement each other. Yes, dot the PET CT can help us see more lesions or sometimes see better, the uh, stage of the disease is better than just with CT MRI. But really, the use of both imaging modalities, CT MRI and the PET CT, is uh, most of the times helpful, the combination of those, to fully characterize the disease. Now, you can see how, in total, a dot the PET CT. Uh, in these large series of patients, again, it was by uh, uh, the study was performed at the NIH, uh, they were uh, eventually able to see the PET CT 95% uh, of the lesions um, in, the, uh, in, uh, in total, which is completely, uh, if we compare it to the world with the octocytes PET CT, they were able to see about one third of those, those lesions, CT MRI, about half of those lesions. So, and then if we go through the different areas, pancreas, liver, bowel, lung, abdomen, and bones, again, the, uh, the superiority of the PET-CT imaging is seen in these numbers with a higher number of lesions seen on a PET-CT. So these are some examples here. So this is a patient who has multifocal small bowel disease with lymph node metastasis. And uh, uh, the PET-CT, which you can see the CT plus the colored part of the images is the PET superimposed on the CT. And you can see there are a number, uh, unfortunately I cannot point to these patients, but there are a number of uh, spots that we can see throughout the different uh, pictures. And those, again, uh, those are areas where the tumor is present. So in different spots of the small bowel was seen and also in some lymph nodes. And this, some of these lymph nodes are these lesions are very, very small and very difficult to see on a CT or an MRI. Uh, this was a particular case of a patient who has a left temporal lesion, so a little bit difficult to point to this without, uh, without an error. But um, on the right side of your right side, uh, um, in, uh, there, there's, uh, there's an area 
um, that is uh, abnormal on the near the brain. And this was uh, uh, seen on uh, NMRI of the brain. Um, it was uncertain whether this was a, a neuroendocrine neuro tumor or not, but most likely. And it was uncertain whether this was a, a meningioma versus a metastatic neuroendocrine tumor. So uh, because of the question of uh, metastatic neuroendocrine tumors, decided to do a dotted FSCT to search for the primary lesion. It is very important in patients with neuroendocrine tumors to identify the primary tumor, the source of the metastasis. And we were able to see in the bottom picture here along the pancreas that, that hot spot uh, is the small hot spot that, that is a lesion in the pancreas. And so we were able to see uh, then uh, once we were able to see this with a PET, um, the, uh, the gastroenterologists at Georgetown were able to, again, through endoscopy, were able to biopsy the lesion in the, in the pancreas and found the primary tumors. In this case, the that it was very helpful to identify the possible size of the primary tumor that was seen on endoscopy biopsy and then eventually taken out. Uh, very, very important. It's a uh, uh, dotted because of the accuracy of uh, higher accuracy to see the lesions uh, is obviously very uh, helpful to see what is the overall uh, tumor burden. So how much of the disease is present in the patient? And we can see this is the, the slide of uh, one slide for the net one study, which is the study that allowed uh, um, eventually uh, the FDA to approve uh, the use of uh, Lutetera. And uh, uh, we can see that uh, uh, the Lutetera um, is uh, uh, overall patients in the blue line to do better when they're treated with Lutetera than uh, without Lutetera. And that, that is true for many types of patients, many tumor burdens and so forth. But what we see in this slide is also that when there is, for example, liver disease, those patients will respond to treatment better uh, uh, when there is a smaller amount of uh, liver disease or when the, the, the lesions in the liver are so smaller. So the accuracy of dotted FSCT, also in evaluation of the liver lesions, is very, very important to try to uh, characterize the, the disease and see uh, which patients we think are more um, uh, suitable for Lutetera versus other types of treatment, such as, for example, liver directed treatment test of the Banamac will will tell us later. This is a patient that has, uh, again, on the left, you see the colored images and some few dots in the liver on the right. Okay, so uh, again, I'm back and I apologize for the interruption once again. Um, so we were discussing about this patient has a multiple small liver lesions. The important thing is that the dot of the PCT tells us that there is no extrahepatic lesion. So that's very important uh, uh, information. Uh, to see that this, the disease is uh, uh, limited to the liver. And again, uh, that is uh, uh, our confidence that that is the, the case is uh, higher because of the higher accuracy of the dotted capacity. This is a different, uh, different uh, um, situation uh, for a patient uh, that uh, has uh, um, multiple liver lesions, and some of them are they're different one from the other. One is large and has less uh, dot attack activity, not as the uh, top left, does not have as much activity on the pet as the other one, which is on the top right. Um, and uh, that makes a difference if one is planning for Lutetera. And you might have to decide whether or not this patient is more suited with the liver directed therapies or uh, um, with uh, for, uh, for Lutetera. Uh, so biological characterization of the tumor, we can see that uh, uh, we know that the neuroendocrine tumors can have can be presenting in different ways biologically. Some of them have low grade uh, neuroendocrine tumors, some have higher grade. As we say G1, G2 are lower grade, G3 is higher grade, and that really reflecting how aggressive the tumor is. So if uh, the tumor has a low grade, uh, it's low grade neuroendocrine tumors and dotted fat is uh, the imaging modality of choice. And that's because the low grade tumors have more somatostatin receptors, which is what is expressed by fat. If the tumor is more aggressive, then uh, they tend to have a higher metabolic activity and that, that is seen with FTG fat, which measures the glucose metabolic activity. And so again, that's, this slide summarizes that. Um, so if, uh, again, if we are, and we know that tumors that have a higher metabolic activity, so higher grade tumors, the DKI-67 index, which is the measure of the, the, the cell proliferation is higher, then uh, that, 
uh, those the, those cancers that might be possible in FGF, and usually they behave. Uh, uh, the overall prognosis for those the tumors is, is worse. This is the case of a patient that initially was thought to be um, a, a colon cancer, but then an FDG PET was performed. But then the final pathology showed a neuroendocrine tumor. And we did a dot of a PET, which is the one uh, uh, on the right. The left is FDG PET. Uh, the whole body image on the right is dot of a PET. And uh, it, it was very positive. But then, uh, soon after the tumor progressed, it became more aggressive. And you can see now on this other picture on the left, top left, bottom left, is that the tumor now has uh, invaded the liver and is a positive on FDG path. So it's a tumor that has changed its biology, it's become more aggressive and a high metabolic activity. Uh, the goal of imaging and neuroimaging tumors is also to um, uh, confirm the presence of the target for the treatment with the Lutatera. The target for the treatment with Lutatera are somatostatin receptors. The PET labels the somatostatin receptors. Again, the energy is different, but we want to make sure that a patient, if we're planning to do Lutatera, has expression in tumors of somatostatin receptors. So that's one indication of to do to the PET. And so the, we always see two different patients. On the left is the patient, you can see the liver, you can see the spleen, you can see the kidney, you can see the bladder. But the activity, we have a couple of lesions, one in the spine and one in the scapula on the left, so bone lesions that have low um, uh, activity on the dot of the PET. On the right is the, is the patient that has the liver lesions that have high expression on somatostatin receptors. So the patient on the left that does not have as many somatostatin receptors is not as good as a target for lutatera treatment as the patient on the right. So it is possible that the patient on the left might be better off with other treatment. And here, this is from the literature, but you can see on the top right, there is a dotate pet, and there are two areas in the liver, those big, dark, black lesions uh, that have high expression on the dot that is. So they seem to be a good target for Dutatera. However, when the FTG PET was done, because the lesion was actually growing significantly and much more rapidly than you would expect for a typical low-grade endocrine tumor, then uh, uh, we saw, again, FTG PET was done, and we saw that one part of that liver lesion was actually very positive on FTG PET. So, even within uh, the same uh, lesions, in, uh, there, uh, one lesion, they were part of the lesion that were more aggressive. And that is very important because we, one might want to decide that, that maybe Lutatera is not as accurate or is effective for that area. And maybe other treatments like uh, a liver directed treatment could be, uh, or even surgery could be an entertainment. So uh, we have uh, um, other possibilities, of course, we would use. Uh, uh, CT, uh, MRI, and also PET to assess how is the response to the treatment. Um, this is a patient that initially responded very well to the treatment, but then later on, top left, bottom left, it showed increased uh, uh, increased uh, uh, lesions. Um, we had to be aware of the fact sometimes the lesions, when they are treated, that they might seem to be becoming larger, but the truth is that they are actually dying and then causing having some necrosis internally, they look larger, um, for example, on, on MRI in this case. Uh, but if we use uh, uh, the SPEC-CT in this case, or PET-CT, we can see that the lesion has a similar level of activity. So sometimes um, a PET and, uh, as I was saying earlier, PET or and MRI, uh, they use and complement each other to give us the most accurate um, um, assessment of whether the tumor has responded to treatment or not. And this is one patient had one lesion in the pancreas, uh, was inoperable, and was treated with uh, with Tetera. And uh, uh, again, a, a, a spec CT or PET CT can be very helpful to assess how the tumor is not only decreasing in size, but also decreasing in the activity. So you can see how after different treatments, that this big lesion in the pancreas now has decreased in size and also in the expression of the somatostatin receptor, giving us a good response. This is how typically we do imaging. Uh, we use imaging. Of course, we use imaging in initial evaluation of these patients to stage them, as I said earlier. Uh, CT MRI is usually the first imaging modality that is done. Again, usually sometimes this patient presented with the abdominal pain or bowel obstruction, and they are then directed to CT or MRI. 
Uh, if the diagnosis is made of an endocrine tumor or suspected, then we would add the PET. Uh, and then, uh, um, and this is for uh, initial staging evaluation if surgery uh, is, uh, can be done or not. And so the patient, we, we will decide whether to do surgery or just wait or just or, or start optiotide. And then uh, the follow-up restaging is done once the treatment is started or after surgery is done, would be with the CT or MRI or PET if needed. And then uh, if uh, it is decided that the patient, patient is not responding to treatment is progressing, then of course, we are entertaining glutatera. And to do glutatera, we have to make sure that the patient has somatostatin receptors on the tumor and PET is the imaging modality to do. And then once it's treated with Lutatera, we would follow them up to see if the, the lesions change in size after treatment with CT or MRI or eventually PET if needed. These are, these are the published uh, uh, proper use criteria for the use of PET CT. I'm not going to go into detail in that because I've pretty much uh, listed already all the cases where dotted PET CT is used. Dr. De Rivera was saying, uh, as she mentioned, that uh, there are a couple of other uh, uh, agents, uh, three, uh, at least three different DOTA tape PET agents that are in the circulation or market or approved for uh, um, by the FDA. Uh, and what, the one that was first approved was a Gang 68 DOTA tape, uh, more recent, the Copper 64 DOTA tape. This is the FDA label. Um, and uh, um, that it's essentially, we, this is the study that compared the, the gallium 68 DOTA talk, which is another form of uh, somatostatin receptor agent, um, copper 64 and gallium 68. And you can see that the number of lesions in this patient top and bottom is pretty much the same. Uh, and uh, when we compare, uh, it, it compares the copper 64 with the gallium 68, clinically, there's not a real difference between the two. Uh, some uh, uh, some uh, um, benefit of copper 64 is mostly for logistical reasons, has a longer half-life, so it is easier to, to ship it. Um, it gives us more flexibility when we're scheduling the patient because the, the, the radioactivity stays uh, longer. Gallium 68, the DOTA talk, is the third of the DOTA tape PET agents that was approved. Uh, and um, and uh, 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 and this is a slide that compares the radiation dose to the patient when they have a PET for these different tracers. Now, um, all these have similar level of uh, exposure for the patient, so not a big difference in terms of how much radiation the patient will receive from these different PET agents. Uh, this is another study that compared the gallium 68 dota talk versus gallium 68 dota the PET in the neoendocrine tumors, and then formally comparing these two agents, we saw that really there was not much of a difference. Um, so in conclusion, the molecular imaging of PET-CT, Delta PET-CT, different agents we have, but the, um, they're all very similar, but molecular imaging helps in the initial staging of the disease, initial evaluation, planning for surgery, or decide what, what is the next step for the treatment of the patients. Once treatment is started, to see, uh, uh, to see, uh, again, characterize the biology and try to understand what is the prognosis of the patient overall. And again, once the treatment is started, what is the um, response to the treatment? Um, I would like to spend the last few minutes talking about the uh, peptide receptor radionuclide therapy. Uh, currently, uh, Lutatera uh, is uh, the um, only agent that is approved by the FDA. Uh, if we switch the radionuclide portion that we attach to the dotted, again, we can do, we can do, uh, so either instead of gallium 68 or copper 64, if we add lutetium 177, which has a bad emission, that is a therapeutic type of radiation, and so we can do treatment. And this is what, uh, um, and this is the typical treatment that's done with Lutatera, is four administrations every eight weeks. And then we, we do it in if a patient is on, on a standard statin or uh, octreotide every four weeks, essentially every other uh, administration of octreotide or standard statin, we would do a Lutatera. Um, and this is what the uh, the outcome of, uh, um, of, uh, of the study, one of the main studies that uh, um, led, was done uh, uh, this in Europe, but showed how um, the proportion of patients that have uh, uh, a response to treatment. And so you can see how um, 
over uh, mostly over 30 percent of the patients had a, a partial response, a complete response. Um, and uh, uh, with a, a very good overall uh, progression of free survival and overall uh, uh, survival. Um, in the, um, uh, there are some side effects uh, from, uh, uh, from uh, the treatment, sorry, um, uh, from the Rutatera, um, but the overall uh, safety profile is quite good especially when compared to chemotherapy, um, only up to one to 2% of the patients developed some delayed toxicity, which could be uh, myelodysplastic syndrome of secondary leukemias, but nephrotoxicity, so renal impairment of hepatic component, uh, hepatic uh, uh, toxicity were very, very, um, in very low numbers. So you can see here, less than 1% of the patients in about uh, uh, three, percent of the patient, but when it will longer follow up, uh, uh, less than one percent of the patient. So really toxicity profile is quite good. Um, we, uh, we know that the higher, the, the more positive the PET scan is, the better the response of these patients. And uh, uh, the another one study that, were, uh, that was done and led to the approval of, uh, of uh, the dotated uh, uh, lutetium and same, same dotated lutatera, um, compared the uh, lutatera with uh, uh, standard octreotide treatment and we can see we found, the study found that there is a, a significant overall benefit in doing, uh, being treated with Lutatera in addition to octreotide standard study and then, then being treated only with, uh, with octreotide. Uh, so a significant, a 79% reduction in the risk of disease progression or death in patients treated with, uh, you know, with the Lutatera. Uh, with uh, the, the Netherlands study uh, showed an objective response uh, in about 18% of the patients uh, overall between complete or partial response uh, had stable disease in 66% of the patients in the progressive disease uh, in only 5% the patients, five percent of the patients, 4% of the patients, as opposed to the, the treatment the patients underwent did not have Lutatera. You can see that the progression disease eight times, uh, well, six times more progression disease um, in the six times less response in patients that did not have um, treatment with Lutatera. Uh, the overall survival, uh, there was a benefit in overall survival in interim analysis that some patients have followed for about two years. Uh, when the patients were followed for a longer time than five years, the overall survival benefit was not statistically, statistically as significant, but the median, uh, uh, again, this is a follow up, uh, actually more than six years follow up approximately. And uh, uh, in, the, in the medium follow-up, you can see that there is not a statistically significant difference, but still a, a median overall survival of 48% of the patients had Lutatera as opposed to 36 months of patients did not have Lutatera. So although not statistically significant, still it was a median, better median overall survival. Um, the, uh, because some of the patients uh, uh, then they were, did not have Lutatera, then were allowed to have Lutatera later on, that kind of confounded a little bit uh, the data, but when that was accounted, the difference in overall survival was even greater, 48 months versus 30, still not statistically significant, but in terms of numbers shows some uh, difference. Um, another one study in these patients, they were then followed for a longer time, about five, six years, Still, the, the safety profile is quite good. Um, so a total of, of uh, only two out of 111 patients eventually develop a myelodysplastic syndrome, which is, uh, um, again, uh, um, and, uh, um, uh, and also nephrotoxicity is, is very, very low. Um, so in conclusion, uh, 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 the Netherlands study confirmed uh, uh, a, a benefit in progression of survival um, and, uh, um, um, and I'm going just going to go a little bit quickly um, on, uh, on this, but um, in uh, uh, patients with large mesenteric disease can be, there can be some questions about, concerns about inflammation in the, in the abdomen uh, and peritoneum. So, Pre-treatment with the steroids can be indicated. Tumor heterogeneity, we have talked about it. If they have very positive or very aggressive, we might, and that may not be as indicated as in this high-grade disease. 
Um, so, um, in the interest of time, I would like to uh, stop here and remind, uh, um, uh, and I just actually briefly wanted to mention uh, what Dr. De Rivera was mentioning is that the alpha um, emitters is a very good option in the future. These are studies that have been conducted at TINO 225 is an alpha emitter. You can see some of these images here, patient with a lot of disease, a good response to treatment. And the overall toxicity profile is actually quite good for these alpha emitters. So a good outcome, good efficacy, and a very good safety profile. So thank you so much. Um, and I also want to remind you that after Dr. Banova, we will have uh, time for questions and for two percent on cases. Thank you. All right, let me uh, take over. I don't know if you can hear me. I'm unmuted. And Dr. Dr. Sposa, to thank you. Uh, and you and Dr. Del Rivera for giving an excellent uh, overview of uh, all the clinical options at the NIH and also for the diagnostics uh, that you just talked about, Dr. Esposito. My, uh, my name is Phil Banovac. I'm, uh, I'm an interventional radiologist and I primarily focus on treatment of cancer within interventional radiology. And uh, I really appreciate being invited to, to, to speak today. So, uh, given the fact that um, uh, you, we, we have a very diverse audience, uh, both uh, physicians and, and patients, other healthcare workers, I kind of um, tailored my talk a little bit to give a high-level overview of uh, what we as interventional radiologists do, and then a little bit later in the talk, get into some details about uh, what we do specifically for neuroendocrine tumors and what our role is in interventional radiology and, um, and what are some of the data and outcomes. So, these are our objectives, um, sort of learning a little bit of of what IR is and how and what we treat uh, in this in the in the spectrum of neuroendocrine tumors and what are these liver directed therapies, which is what we primarily um, uh, uh, do and what Dr. Esposito uh, mentioned. Um, some uh, specifics about these liver directed therapies, both thermal and catheter directed therapies, and uh, and some efficacy um, in uh, liver directed therapies and control of neuroendocrine tumors in the liver. So interventional radiology, what is it? Uh, it's uh, it's actually a medical specialty. We focus on using image guidance to treat uh, diseases with what we hope is a less invasive approach. Uh, it used to be a subspecialty of radiology for, for uh, many, many years. And then in 2014, American Board of Medical Specialties actually gave interventional radiology a full specialty status. So we are our own, uh, we have our own residency training now and our own specialty and a primary certificate. It is the youngest of all primary special specialties in the United States. It is actually probably not well known uh, that we are a separate specialty. And you know, I'm, I'm guessing even many of my uh, colleagues in, in, in medicine are not necessarily aware of that, but that's what it is. So you know, to get a primary specialty, um, this slide kind of shows you how infrequently that happens. On the, on the left side, it's very small, but I'll give you some idea, like anesthesiology, for example, 1938, you know, um, ophthalmology in 1916. So, so it's not every day that uh, ABMS uh, offers a primary certificate. In the last, you know, 40 years now, uh, only four specialties have been recognized as new, um, you know, emergency medicine, 1980, and then the most recent one is uh, interventional radiology combined with diagnostic. <clears throat> so anyway, so at Georgetown, um, it, it, it was the first approved program in 2014. So we actually had the very first program in the country to be approved for the IR residency in the United States. So in some ways, Mesta Georgetown University Hospital International Radiology was always going to be the, the oldest program, uh, the first program in the country. We're very proud of that. And, <clears throat> and we um, this is just a little brief intro to kind of set up the stage for what we do. So, so what is the role, I'm making a little pivot here, what is the role of um, interventional radiology in treatment of neuroendocrine tumors? And what we really do is we mostly deal with a rather advanced disease, um, meaning disease that has already spread to, to the liver for the most part. Um, and we use what we call these liver-directed therapies um, to, to treat uh, neuroendocrine, uh, neuroendocrine cancers. Um, so this looks very busy, but kind of to simplify it, if you look from the left side of the chart to the right, it's essentially sort of progression of, 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 um, how a neuroendocrine tumor is treated. 
on the very left column is the diagnostics, you know, is the CT, the MRI, the, the PET scans, the uh, nuclear me medicine scintigraphy, and various other things that were already discussed by Dr. Esposito. And then if you sort of move to the next column, you know, what the, the, the things that are sort of bluish tint, uh, you can see the word resection in there, resect the primary, resection if possible, consider resection of primary tumor. And, uh, you know, so clearly uh, uh, cutting out a majority of the bulk in this disease is, is very important in the early stages. And then sort of the reddish tint uh, is the, you know, uh, octreotide, lanreotide, the um, and and uh, and other uh, systemic uh, therapies, and you really have to kind of work uh, your way way over to the right side of the chart, where the disease is unfortunately rather advanced, where the 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 green circle you see is the liver directed therapies for liver predominant disease, and this is sort of where where uh, interventional radiology comes in. So we we don't really deal with this disease when it's localized. There are other treatments that are effective, um, but once this once it's pressed to the liver and uh, and uh, metastatic load in the liver increases, we have a variety of options, which I'm going to talk to you about to deal with it and, and hopefully have um, some good outcomes and prolong progression-free survival and overall survival of the patients. So liver-directed therapies. Uh, there really are many types of liver-directed therapies, um, and they all deal with really neuroendocrine tumor of the burden um, a burden in the liver. So the simplest way to describe these therapies is really to kind of break them down into ablation and catheter embolization. So ablation is when we use uh, extreme heat or cold to destroy the cancer. Uh, we usually stick it directly with a, with a needle using some form of image guidance. And then we apply extreme heat or cold through that special needle to essentially create sort of a spherical or um, ball of, of thermal energy, which, which kills, kills cancer cells. Um, catheter embolization is a little bit different. We use a vascular catheter to navigate it through the body and get it eventually to the liver and into the area of the liver that has, has neuroendocrine tumors. And then we can inject things. We can inject particles to cut off its blood supply or chemo, uh, chemo, uh, chemotherapy combined with particles. And, and so forth and so on. And we're going to go into a little bit more um, detail about these um, therapies um, in the next couple of slides. So kind of starting with, with ablation, liver-directed therapy ablation. They're really, um, the two highlighted ones you see are the thermal ones, because these are the ones that we use the most in, uh, in, in this day and age. There are other kinds uh, in, the, in the first iterations of ablation, people injected percutaneous alcohol um, directly into tumors, and uh, that's sort of uh, not really used very much anymore. Although it is significantly cheaper, but you just cannot get, you just can't get the ball, the size uh, of, of ablation that you need with, uh, with injection of alcohol, as you would with uh, with the thermal thermal uh, ablation energies. So um, the two thermal apl applicators we have these days are microwave and radio frequency. Microwave is a little bit newer. It's predominantly uh, the one that most of the people in the country now use. Uh, radio frequency was certainly there and it still is there. Uh, in the last couple of uh, years, the microwave really sort of took over because it has certain technical advantages um, that allow us to treat these tumors better. And then cryoablation, which is uh, using a, a cold therapy on a different kind of needle. It's not so much used in neuroendocrine tumors. It's mostly used in, a, a more, it's more used in kidney cancer and so forth. And then some other non-thermal things like electroporation, which is sort of beyond the scope of, of this talk, and it's not used very much in, a, in neuroendocrine tumors. So this is a schematic of, of sort of what we do. So you obviously see on the left side of the image, and I'm sorry, that there's no way for me to control the pointer. Um, so I have to sort of describe what I'm talking about. The, on the left side of the image, there's a schematic of a liver with a, with a tumor in it. You can see that the liver has its own uh, blood supply. The red would be the arteries. The blue would be the veins. And then in the top left corner, uh, you see a needle uh, with sort of a special applicator. Uh, and, and the idea is to stick the tumor with, um, with this needle and then connect it to this generator, which is on the right side of the image. And, uh, you know, after you apply a certain, a certain predetermined wattage that you want to uh, determine how big of a ball of tumor ablation you want to create, 
um, you know, the wattage and time is what determines largely uh, how big of a treatment area we get. And then that's how you treat it. Now, this technology can be done, it can be applied in multiple ways. You can do it um, open, laparoscopic, so surgeons use it in the operating room to go after uh, lesions in the liver without really having to open the capsule. They can actually also use um, intraoperative ultrasound to get the to get a uh, microwave probe into the tumors, or you can do it the way uh, we do it in interventional radiology, where we go through the skin um, using image guidance, like a, usually a, either ultrasound or CT scan, and then <clears throat> we stick these tumors and do the same thing. We apply energy until the tumor is uh, destroyed. So uh, these are just some sort of a, um, a series of CT images, uh, some kind of showing the progression on the very left side of the screen. This is a, a radio frequency probe. You can see on the left side of the screen, sort of this darker area uh, in the liver, which uh, represents a, a tumor. Uh, and then in the middle image, you see there is a metal probe uh, sticking into the same portion of the liver with this little umbrella looking like tines that come out. And then in the third image on the on the right, you see that it's um, sort of this hypo, uh, hypo uh, dense area where the um, ap applicator has been turned on and the treatment is ongoing. So. Uh, usually about you know, 10 minutes or less, we can get a pretty good spherical treatment. And, and this is how it's done. At that point, you would remove these needles and you literally uh, go home with a Band-Aid and the tumor, tumor is treated. Um, so uh, some imaging corresponding, again, same image on the left. And then there's a PET-CT image in the middle, which kind of shows that, uh, that there is absolutely no activity in the area that was treated. It's now a photopenic, it's called. And then on the right side of the image, this is a follow-up scan <clears throat> several months later, showing nothing but just a dark ball, which is essentially a scar, and um, and there's no viable no viable tumor. So this is an example of, of a, what would be a successful um, ablation therapy. <clears throat> so uh, the other things, and now we're going to pivot a little bit. We're going to talk about the other uh, liver uh, liver directed therapy, uh, and that is uh, that is called embolization. Embolizations are done through a vascular catheter. Um, we usually get into the body in the into the femoral artery, which is in the a hip uh, area, sort of in the leg. Um, and then we guide the catheter through the blood vessels under X-ray control. Uh, we get in the liver, and then we sort of do our business there. We get to the tumor and do a bunch of diagnostic uh, images, try to find exactly what is the blood supply to the cancer or or blood to multiple cancers and then we apply our treatment so uh for to, to do that we have to inject radiographic contrast to see the blood supply to the liver and the tumor so once we get into the liver with the embolization techniques uh these as i said are done uh, through a vascular catheter we try to get as close as we can so we even use a smaller catheter so-called micro catheter and then we have an option to to do three different things we can do what's called bland embolization, or some people call it transarterial embolization with uh, just bland particles. In other words, they don't have any chemo on it. They just basically act to cut off the blood supply to the tumor. And that procedure is sometimes referred to as uh, bland embolization or TAE. Or we can inject a combination of chemotherapy and particles, also known as chemoembolization. Um, other common name is transarterial chemoembolization, but that's too many words, so we just call it TACE. And then in the last two decades, um, a new innovation came around where we started to inject radioactive particles with yttrium-90, uh, which was also mentioned by Dr. Esposito in one of his uh, final slides. And that's called radioembolization, where we actually inject particles that are loaded with uh, uh, high-energy beta emitters that can kill the tumor by uh, means of uh, radioactivity that is injected into the tumor. And you know that procedure is sometimes referred to as TEAR, uh, many people just call it Y90 treatment, so those are synonymous when you hear us talk about that. So um, this is sort of a schematic of how how this uh, catheter-directed therapy will work. The In the top right of the screen, you see a little catheter, a little black line sticking into the blood vessel, and the tiny little particles are showered into the tumor from the tip of that catheter until the blood supply is cut off. So another schematic from our Society of Interventional Radiology, uh, which is a little different in this particular schematic. We can inject chemotherapy first on the slide on the left. Then we follow the particles, which would be slide in the middle, 
and then uh, beyond that, you see sort of a follow-up outcome uh, months later when the tumor um, gets smaller because we treated it with chemo and with uh, ablated particles or embolic particles. Sorry. All right, so this is a this is that example of what a microcatheter looks like. Uh, this is sort of the tool that we use. Uh, I showed you in the previous slide. The tip is what we we want to get the tip of this catheter the way we want it. But it's you know it's almost 130 centimeters long. It's very tiny, not very invasive, and it's very flexible. So we can uh, guide it and get it to to uh, all the way from the leg all the way into the liver through the blood vessels and and position it right in front of the, the tumor or in the segment of the liver that contains tumor or tumors, cancers, and then we can do one of those three things I mentioned. So, so this is a, sort of the, we're kind of getting a little bit of data on state of the ablated therapies, pivoting back to ablation and sort of uh, give you some idea. So the ablation is, you know, microwave or radio frequency, and when do we use these? Um, I'd say that more aggressive thermal ablations are done for uh, what we call oligometastatic disease. Um, basically, when we have uh, one or few metastases in the liver, and uh, then we can go after them with these thermal, thermal ablative energies. What is really critical, though, for us to be able to do that is to have pr good pre-procedural imaging. And because that simply defines where the tumors are in an absence of knowing where they are and whether they're accessible, it's not really possible to treat them with ablative therapies. So we want to know the exact number and exact size of the tumors. We want to use, uh, usually we like to have an MRI with so-called hepatobiliary agents, such as EOVIST. And the ultimate goal is to get, a, to, get an, a, um, to get a good ablation, which gives us good local control of the tumor and fast symptomatic improvement. And this is sort of where we are, I think, in interventional radiology. Those are the two main goals, local control and symptomatic improvement. We're not really curative at that point. It's a very advanced disease, as I pointed out earlier. But we can certainly help the patients feel better and you know, hopefully prolong the uh, time to progression and, uh, and also reduce their symptoms. So to plan a good ablation, it's really, have, it's really important to have good imaging. And to plan the sequence and the extent of ablation, we really must define where the metastases are in the, in the liver. So a couple of, a couple of papers, uh, this one by Jing, really showed that uh, if you use hepatobiliary agents such as EOVIST or similar, you can really improve your detection of a metastatic, metastatic foci in, uh, uh, in, um, um, in the liver. Looking at you know, 256 patients with 560 metastases, conventional imaging you know, was still very good, 88%, but if you added the late phase, hepatobiliary phase imaging, uh, you can really improve your detection to 95% or so. So that is what we prefer to use. So there are a couple of uh, papers that came out about um, the experience uh, and predictors of survival uh, for radiofrequency ablation of neuroendocrine tumors. And this is uh, by uh, Mazeglia. This is actually uh, uh, came out in surgical literature. And you can see most of the, it was a single center evaluation of uh, laparoscopic, so surgically open radiofrequency ablation for uh, metastatic neuroendocrine tumors. Uh, 63 patients with 450 liver metastases. So if you kind of think about that, 63 patients with 450 liver metastases. So all these patients had multiple, multiple liver meds. They're very advanced, right? On average, probably about eight meds per liver in this group of 63 patients. And they did a total of 80 procedures. And then when you look at the results, even though the, even though the disease was quite advanced and they had you know multiple metastases, looks like seven or eight on the average, right? The, the median survival from time of radio frequency ablation was uh, 3.9 years. And median survival from the time they were, they, they were diagnosed with metastatic disease to start with was 5.5 years. And then at the bottom, you'll see that the overall survival since the time of the diagnosis was, was 11 years. So, so I think these, these folks are the, you know, probably uh, followed very closely and they probably had other treatments. And then by the time they got to uh, ablative therapies, they were very, very advanced, but all they're not, uh, all they're not understanding, the survival is actually very good from the time of initial diagnosis to, to all median survival of 11 years, um, you know, for, the, for uh, advanced, uh, advanced cancer is, is quite good. Um, so the biggest predictor of, of, of what they found of survival is how much tumor you have. So really focusing on the, on the curves on the right side of the graph, you know, if it's a small volume of, of uh, aggregate disease, less than 30 cubic centimeters, then those people survived 5.4 years in, uh, as a median. Whereas, you know, if they had a bigger aggregate volume of disease, 
like over 75 cubic uh, centimeters than the survival median survival drop of 2.7 years, which is sort of intuitive um, because, you know, obviously with more tumor, you're more advanced than you would expect that those fo folks wouldn't do necessarily as well uh, as people with less tumor. So I guess the moral of that story is that, you know, if you, if you have patients that have a small volume um, disease, um, you know, it would be good to refer them uh, for this kind of treatment to us early because we can actually have, we can, uh, we can get better, better uh, survival if we treat it, if we treat the disease earlier. So another, another paper about radiofrequency ablation of neuroendocrine um, uh, metastases. It's a, this is sort of a systematic review. Um, and they looked at eight studies uh, in this review with 301 patients. That was they were treated with ablative therapy for metastatic neuroendocrine tumor, and not all there was about a quarter of them were percutaneous, and the other three quarters were open or laparoscopic, and forty eight percent in this uh, in this in this um, uh, uh, systematic review actually had a concomitant liver resection, and the the main thing the main point of this is that ninety two percent of the patients who uh, who had prior symptoms prior to ablation were they were reported to have partial or complete symptom relief, so really. Uh, doing these ablative therapies, like I said earlier, the main goal is to reduce patient symptoms and hopefully to to render them, um, you know, um, to to okay, hopefully to give them some some overall over, uh, progression free survival benefit. But symptom relief is definitely a plus, and it definitely does occur after we ablate these tumors. All right, so um, those are the so the, so those are the goals: high degree of symptom control, potential survival benefit, and then. Just of note, you know, these the good nice thing about ablative therapies is you can come back and do it again. So a lot of times you follow these folks with the imaging, and then if um, if they get new metastases or if some of the stuff that we treated recurred, we can go back with the uh, with the probe and, and image guidance and ablate it again for the most part. So this is sort of a typical example. You can see a very small tumor in the top right of the of the liver, and then an ablative probe is inserted through the skin and into the liver. Antennas are deployed. And then so this would be sort of the final image of if you take the needle out with hyperemia around this sort of darker, darker area where the where the ablation and tissue tissue destruction happened. All right. So recent advancements in ablative therapies. Um, I'm just touching this briefly. Sometimes you know we have a hard time getting to where we want. And especially if the tumors are very high up in the liver, in the dome. It used to be quite a challenge uh, because the, the, that area is guarded by, by the lungs. So this is an example of a tumor like that. You see this little bright spot in the, in the liver dome that is kind of close to the vena cava and touching the diaphragm, essentially. So the conventional ablation uh, was difficult. But now we have some new technologies uh, in the interventional radiology suite. It's called cone beam CT with, uh, with targeting. So we're able to essentially... Uh, go out of plane and do these uh, procedures on much deeper angles than we used to be able to with a conventional CT scanner. So to kind of give you an idea, let's see if this, this movie will play or not. Doesn't look like it's playing, but we can go on pretty steep angles to get into, into this. So patients, um, uh, so let's see. So we can skip through all this. All right, so let's let's look at this um, uh, hepatic arterial, hepatic, hepatic directed arterial embolization for uh, for uh, pre predominantly liver disease. So I mentioned earlier the three different kinds. There's blend embolization, chemoembolization, and radioactive or tear radioembolization. So the biggest question, you know, we get a lot of times is which one should we use for neuroendocrine tumors? And that's what I'm going to try to cover here for a little bit. All right. So in uh, liver, so we really use this uh, embolic therapy with catheter for liver-only metastatic disease or liver-only liver progressive disease. Um, because a diffuse progression of tumor burden is really what ultimately uh, does uh, uh, largely result in uh, patient death. Uh, so our, our directed therapy is to reduce this term of tumor burden and to, to reduce the uh, amount of active disease in the liver. So this is a schematic of a normal uh, liver and tumor supply. And as you see, the two blood vessels at the bottom are the uh, so-called portal vein and hepatic artery. Um, the amount of blood that a portal vein brings to the liver is probably even higher than 60%, maybe even 70. So it's like 70 30 split. So we use that because we only work through the artery to embolize these tumors. So we have a fair amount of latitude in embolizing them because we don't really touch the portal vein and the liver around, surrounding the liver still gets a blood supply while we can target the tumors through the artery. 
And then on top, you see the hepatic vein. That's the vein that takes the blood away from the liver. All right, so this is another schematic. So using those arteries, those bright red lines, we can actually target the tumor um, with a catheter directly. So what are the con absolute contraindications to doing catheterodectomy therapy? Basically, if the patients get uh, have poor liver functions, the total uh, bilirubin of greater than two, or if the portal vein is occluded, um, we, we, we have some limitations. And if they have a poor performance, equal performance status to start with, uh, we have to really think about whether we're going to actually help them or make them worse uh, if we if we um, use these catheter-directed therapies. So um, the factors that affect uh, paired procedural mobility and mortality uh, after embolization uh, were looked at uh, by Sophocleus and, and, and his partners, so single center with respective evaluation. They looked at 137 patients with uh, twice, more than twice as many uh, bland embolizations for metastatic um, disease. And I just want to show you, like in this cohort, these are these are people that are very sick. Liver involvement in metastatic disease, more than 50% of the liver is involved in 40% in 40 of the patients. So these are patients that have many, many meds. These are very advanced, uh, very advanced patients. And, the, and, and, and that notwithstanding, though, the median overall survival was 43.1 months. So, uh, and pretty low complication rates. Grade one, uh, one grade four complication and 10 grade three complications, less than 3% in this whole cohort. So, uh, you know, so you can actually achieve uh, a pretty good overall survival, despite the fact that you are, um, you're, you're dealing with a very advanced population um, with uh, advanced liver cancer. So, uh, transitorial embolization for metastatic neuroendocrine tumors. They're looking at, um, this is a, a, a study from Naples, a uh, large cohort, 896 patients with um, 979 procedures. And again, median survival, a little bit of a broad reported spectrum from 10 to 80 months. But they had a good objective tumor response rate, 50%. Uh, and then in not in, 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 and then about 14% had um, post-stimulization syndrome and other adverse events. But overall, uh, it was uh, pretty well tolerated. But again, uh, pretty reasonable overall survival with, with an advanced group of patients. So symptomatic response, which is the thing we aim at between, you know, um, 60 and 80% um, of patients decreased, um, reported uh, decrease in their symptoms, mostly neuroendocrine specific symptoms, such as flushing, diarrhea, um, the things that were mentioned before, or, or localized pain from the, from the disease. Example of an MRI. And again, this shows you how, how, uh, how advanced uh, these folks are when we, when we, when we get our referrals. So, many, many metastases in the liver, um, both uh, higher up in the liver and down in the inferior portion, very, very large metastases. And then patient was treated with blend embolization, and you can see uh, how much uh, how much of a nice response they get. The tumor is largely necrotic, infarcted, and <clears throat> non-viable. So before, on the left, before and after, before is on the right, and after is on the left. Obviously, one is an MRI, one is a CT. All right, so chemoembolization. This is when we kind of put a little bit of chemo in there, too. Um, this is the other ablative uh, treatment. Um, and we have uh, two different kinds. We have conventional chemoembolization and drug eluting bead chemoembolization. Uh, and, you know, for the most part, people have a preference of using one or the other. I personally use conventional chemoembolization more. Um, but uh, drug eluting beads have shown some benefit in other kinds of tumors. <clears throat> so a lot of people use drug eluting bead chemoembolization. So transarterial chemoembolization um, uh, with, uh, was looked at by Terry DeBeer. Uh, this is an early study back in uh, uh, 2008. They did a small cohort of people with um, neuroendocrine tumors and showed very nice response rates, 20, 20 patients. So not a big, not a big cohort. But, you know, it had a, a partial response in 80% and stable disease in 15% and pro these, disease progression only in 5%. Median time to progression was 15 months. So, you know, so this kind of early paper looking at this um, really, again, solidified that we needed the, to look look at this treatment more carefully. And, and uh, since then, it's been pretty well accepted. And again, the the, the main goal is to decrease symptoms. So, so 9 out of 11 people ex exhibit a decrease in at least uh, one of their symptoms. 50% is stool flush and frequency, in other words, diarrhea. Let's skip through that. And then radioembolization, which is the radioactive particle injection. Um, so um, 
since radiobilization came around, everybody's wondering, can we use it for metastatic neuroendocrine disease? And you can. This is a paper by Zlatko Devchich, who is, um, at the time he was at Stanford, but I think he's down in Mayo Clinic now in, um, in Florida, and did a nice uh, meta-analysis of 12, 12 different um, uh, patients, 12 different studies, sorry, 414 patients, showing, you know, these response rate, disease response rate of 50%, and um, and disease control rate, which would be, I guess, a st stable disease, 86%. So radioembolization also works um, to control this disease. And then, um, um, and this is sort of the images of pre and post, right? So on the right side, you have, um, uh, on the left side of the screen, you have before treatment. On the right, you can see the tumor tumor shrink, and it's, uh, it's looking a lot better. And some of them actually disappeared. So, uh, so comparison of the three, you know, should we do blend? Should we do taste? Should we do um, radioactive? And we really, when they were looking at this um, um, in Chen and all, I think what they found is that the median uh, hepatic um, um, progression-free survival is about 13 months and oral survival is, again, almost four years. Uh, but there was not really a statistical difference in, um, in, uh, these, three, in these three different um, treatments. Um, so if you look at the right column, the p-values have not met statistical significance. So whether you use taste there or um, or, or, or uh, TAE, uh, there's really no uh, significant difference. So TAE is obviously the cheapest of all because you don't have to use either chemotherapy or radiation. So most people these days will actually recommend bland embolization for neuroendocrine tumors. And most people here at Georgetown, that's what we predominantly use. The So despite its efficacy, the... Uh, the uh, yttrium has been shown that um, you kind of have some delayed complications. A lot of people end up with cirrhosis, like morphology, and ascites and varices. And I think I think part of the reason is that we give a pretty uh, large dose of radiation, and these uh, neuroendocrine tumor patients they tend to survive a long time, right? So if you're dealing with some other tumors that where survival is a lot shorter, they don't have enough time to develop complications of the synthetic liver function. Whereas neuroendocrine tumors we give this pretty large dose of radiation and then, you know, patients are surviving four or five years after that and they start to start to get uh, toxicity um, from radiation that we injected, you know, four or five years ago. So um, I'm going to actually uh, uh, end there because I know that we have to, um, we have to, uh, to finish by 1045. I want to give it uh, maybe 15 minutes uh, to the, the group to answer any questions or have a discussion. So, Dr. Esposito, I don't know if you're still on, but maybe I could turn it over back to you. And yes, thank sir. you very much for inviting me. Um, I know you might want to show some cases. Yeah, hi, Phil. Uh, no, thank you so much. Uh, that's great. Yes, I'm alone. Hopefully, everybody can hear me. Um, so, um, yeah, in between technical difficulties, and of course, we have uh, uh, our time for questions and cases. So I would like to give priority to any questions that have come. And I think, Phil, that there's, there's one question uh, which probably uh, uh, is within your field of expertise. I don't know if you can see it, but is one question. Uh, view questions. Let's see. View questions. In the case yeah. of extensive unresectable liver exclusive, very predominant disease, do you see a role for hepatic chemosaturation and hemofiltration? Um, Hmm. A little, little bit out of my league. I'm not really sure um, in light of uh, present other therapeutic options. You know, I'm, I can't tell you that I can really answer the question other than guess. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't do that. Um, I don't know if maybe some of my colleagues have have some thoughts or maybe heard of some of these attempt, attempts. Chemosaturation, chemofiltration. Yeah, I, I have uh, uh, obviously not my area of expertise. I'm not sure if uh, uh, Jadira at the NIH has any uh, knowledge of, of uh, this. Uh, Jadira, I'm not sure if you're uh, on or if you have any knowledge of this. Mm, yes, I'm here, I'm here. But yeah. yes, I personally have not also hear of that. Uh, and just to let you know, I mean, chemo, any type of chemo embolization is not something that we recommend for neuroendocrine tumors. 
um, I know that Dr. Solent, uh, uh, UPENT had, um, it has a study of different type of uh, liver directed therapies. So hopefully we'll learn from that and get more information about it. But just overall, in terms of any type of chemoembolization therapies, is not something that we necessarily recommend for neuroendocrine tumors because these are not like colon cancer or a patella or cholangia or a, even adrenocortical carcinoma kind of tumors. You know, these type of uh, neuroendocrine tumors into the liver, they mainly push the liver parenchyma. So that's the reason why even surgery in a subset of patients can be beneficial uh, because they're trying to do this type of surgery to spare as more healthy liver as possible. And uh, because of all of that, I mean, in chemoembolization is not something that we necessarily recommend or Radioembolization, I think there is also some experience with that, but then it causes uh, scar tissue sometimes, you know, kind of like you need to be careful about that, especially if we plan for uh, PRT with Luthera. But yes, that will be my answer in terms of that. I don't have any knowledge, but even any type of chemoembolization is not something that we necessarily recommend for well differentiated neuroendocrine tumors. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Jody. That's uh, very helpful. So, um, I have one question from uh, uh, from John Marshall. I think and so he's essentially asking. Um, I don't know if you can see it, but in, in a patient with escalating carcinoid syndrome, how high a dose of, of uh, uh, long acting um, LAR have you used? I can answer that question. Just just for sandostatin, the maximum dose that we have used is sixty. Um, and for Lanriotai, it's only one standard dose, which is 120 uh, millig uh, milligrams. Lanriotai is subcutaneous, and the statin is intramuscular. Uh, once it's more than 30 milligrams, then you have to give two injections. But the maximum that we just use is 60 milligrams of the uh, sandostatin. If we feel that, um, you know, there is still, uh, we need to achieve any type of symptom control as to we maximize any of the SSAs or we decrease the frequency instead of every four weeks, every uh, three weeks, then we have to use other uh, therapies such as uh, Cermelo, we discussed about the lottery stat that blocks the right limited enzyme of um, to defend to serotonin, that may be one option. Another option is which just antimotility agents can use. Tinter of opium is actually quite good for some of these uh, the, the carcinoma syndrome diarrhea. But at the same time, it's like we need to discuss whether systemic therapies can also be an option here or liver directed therapies. We know that neuroendocrine tumors do metastasize to the liver most very commonly. So whether type of liver direct therapy in those patients with symptomatic carcinoid syndromes, could that be something to consider? Uh, Luthothera as well is known to also not only slow down the growth to have benefit and progression free survival, but at the same time, it also helps to uh, uh, the symptoms related to hormone excess. So those are the things. So we do still have a, a few agents in our um treatment algorithm that we can use in those patients but yes i mean it's a good question but that yes those are that would be my answer in terms of uh sandostatin versus landry or okay great thank you so much and then a couple other questions i think one is uh um uh, how often do patients not complete the rutathera infusions due to tox uh, uh, toxicity and particularly uh myosuppression so um, maybe I can start answering that and then Jadira, if you have more uh, information as well on your end. But I would say that of all the patients that we have, at least we've been referred to us, which is close probably to 100 patients, we've had, uh, uh, we, we've had probably, see, the, the majority of the patients that have not completed the, 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 the treatment is, is because of uh, disease progression. Some of these patients who did not have had some lesions that did not have very, very high uptake of the data, some did. Of course, we did see progression in the areas where we did not have very, very high uptake. But in terms of, we've had a couple of patients that could not uh, um, complete the, for, the fourth treatment because of some renal problems. Uh, but in terms of uh, myotoxicity, they can remember there have probably been three or four patients that uh, we have not been able to complete the full course of treatment because of a myosuppression. We've had some patients where we have had to reduce the dose. So the standard dose is 200 millicuries, 
and we've had some patients that we've had to decrease to 100 millicuries because of some myotoxicity. Uh, but we've been able to, with exception of one, we've been able to complete uh, with uh, with a lower dose. Um, Dr. Posida, yes, I agree with that. I think uh, most of the patients I have seen, you know, they're able to complete their four cycles of uh, Luthathera. I think in terms of uh, kidney dysfunctions that, you know, we have seen that sometimes the dose is reduced on that. Um, in terms of myelosuppression, and that's something that was presented also at the NANETS meeting too this year, is kind of like what is the risk of myelosuppression. I think Luthathera, it just, and Dr. Cesar, please feel free to add anything more that I miss, is that overall these patients are able to um, um, to tolerate Luthathera quite well. The risk of myelosuppression is quite low, 1% to 3%. That said, I think that the risk will be higher in patients that have been heavily pretreated with chemotherapy. So that's something that we have seen. And even in Europe, they have reported higher maybe, but that's, you have to keep it into the context of what other treatments the patient had received that may cause um, you know, myelosuppression. But that's, I agree with you in terms of, um, uh, of you know, most of patients are able to tolerate the four doses. And now we are in the phase like where, well, now that the patient told, where some benefit of Luthathera, could we uh, retreat those patients again? And I know that the NCT and uh, Dr. Shahan will lead this upcoming study of Luthathera retreatment to answer those questions and how many more cycles of course. Um, yeah, I completely agree with you. And, and as a matter of fact, I think there's been a, a, a change in the type of patients that are coming to us, at least in my experience. Uh, so initially, when the was approved, we were uh, the patients that had been waiting for a long time. So they were more advanced disease, more compromised patients. We, we were receiving those kind of type of patients. But that's as uh, the awareness of the treatment has become, uh, um, you know, greater among the patients and the referring physicians. I think we and we've had patients that are uh, better uh, to begin with with the and right? so that the, the, the number of patients that have had to discontinue the treatment is, is a lot less. Um, one more question from, uh, from John again, what role, and maybe this, this is from Jadira, what role is here? Is there for molecular profiling of a neuroendocrine tumors as this is done in other uh, uh, cancers? Yeah. Yeah, that's an excellent question, Dr. Marshall. And I have to say that, I mean, we do it as part of our study at the NIH, but what we have found is like small bowel neuroendocrine tumors are very molecularly bland. We really haven't find any significant mutations. Uh, pancreas neuroendocrine tumors, on the other hand, uh, they have other mutations that has helped understand more about the biology of these tumors and even associated with more, more aggressive behavior as well, like ATR, DAX, ATRX gene. But that said, until now, we don't haven't found anything that we can target with treatments. Um, and that's kind of like we know for the neuroendocrine tumors. Um, and uh, if, if sometimes my patients may ask, you know, like germline testing too, but again, the less than 10% of these neuroendocrine tumors may be associated with cancer predisposition syndrome, such as MENM1, von Hippelando, NF1, tuberous sclerosis. Uh, but usually even the clinical presentation sometimes guide us to that. Um, the same for the rare subsets of neuroendocrine tumors, such as pheochromocytomas and paragangliomas. All patients with pheochromocytomas and paragangliomas must need to undergo genetic testing for germline evaluation, not necessarily for molecular testing, because again, there is nothing to, today that we can target with treatments. Sometimes doing this molecular profile help us understand more about uh, how aggressive the tumors may be. That said, something I want to mention is Dr. Reedy at Memorial Sloan Kadrin had done six sequent um, biopsies as well on these patients with well differentiated near endocrine tumors uh, throughout certain periods of time. And what she found and reported and published as well was that this patient has a different mutational burden as they, you know, they with the course of the disease and after they had received different systemic therapies, alkylated agencies so for, they may have a different uh, mutational burden that help us understand more about this, the aggressiveness of the tumor, but nothing necessarily that can help us more about any, any targeted therapies. 
Thank you. Thank you again, Jadira. And then there's one question. Uh, I think this will be the last question. Uh, uh, can you discuss the longer term side effects of the thyroid such as increased additions in the abdomen and potential intestinal blockages? So, you know, I should want one, one slide, but in terms of time, I, I kind of skip quickly through it. Um, so, in the patient have extensive peritoneal disease, uh, uh, there is a, a possibility uh, that the radiation causes an inflammation, then eventually with time, uh, a scar formation and uh, and obstruction. It doesn't happen that often. Um, I think it's uh, um, we've had a couple of patients who um, never really had uh, actual uh, uh, obstruction, but intermittent uh, pain. And uh, uh, and so the, the pre treatment, the some advocate for treatment with the steroids, a cortisone, of course, a cortisone. Is it kind of debated? Not everybody agrees to it. Um, even uh, uh, patients with being uh, uh, treated with external radiation to the abdomen, it's questionable whether they uh, steroids help or not. Um, but uh, um, yeah, I don't know if uh, anybody has other additional uh, feedback on that. But again, this is not something that I've seen uh, uh, at all uh, obstruction, uh, abdominal obstruction or, or blockage uh, in my experience. Unresolved it has needed uh, um, uh, uh, treatment. And it, sometimes it's uncertain whether it's the progression of the disease versus uh, the uh, side effects of the Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, I agree with you, Dr. Spacito. And I, I can make a comment to Dr. Marshall, I hope, about the N-TRAC bound is mobile. Well, I think there has been reported, you're correct, even on pancreas, uh, neuroendocrine tumors as well, very rarely found. But at the same time, even if we can use N-TRAC inhibitors, I think there are other options that, unless it's done in the setting of a clinical trial, of course, that can help us to determine the efficacy of these N-TRAC inhibitors in neuroendocrine tumors. Because even though we find these mutations, we also know that every solid tumors may not have, you know, may respond differently. The same with adenocortical cancer, we have found red mutations with direct inhibitors, and we don't see the same efficacy of other solid tumors with the same mutations. That said, I think we do have other options in your endocrine tumors, such as PRT and alpha PRT, PRT combination that can help us you know, prolong the survival on this patient. <laughs> no, excellent point. And I think this is something where maybe with more research, research we'll understand. Great. Thank you so much. I think we are at 10.45. Uh, we can leave the podium to Dr. Marshall. And I'd like to thank Jadira and Philip for participating. Thank you so much. And thank you thank for you. those who have listened to us. Thank you. Bye-bye. You guys are awesome. Thank you very, very much. And thank you for sharing your time and your brilliance and your energy to help all of us get up to speed on uh, the neuroendocrine world. And you guys just, it was great. I appreciate it very much. Um, we are now going to kind of shift gears to our annual uh, patient symposium. Um, and let us get going on that. So um, I'll give a brief introduction for everyone, and then we will set into our, we're going to have a short video actually, and then we'll set into our uh, initial um, uh, discussion. So um, I want to particularly thank all of our supporters um, uh, for uh, what they have done and enabled us to do. We started Thursday night with a live event um, that was fabulous. There are actual human beings, three-dimensional human beings there. Um, yesterday, we had a great series of uh, meetings that were hybrid, um, and today's uh, focus on patients and patient advocacy uh, it couldn't happen without all the support that we have uh, from our partners, and nor could it happen without the team behind the scenes. And I want to give a particular shout out uh, to our Roosh Center team who starts this process, honestly, the day after we finish last year's symposium uh, to try and bring the best content we can for everyone in our uh, GI cancer community. And we couldn't do it on the scale that we do it without our partners with Michael J. Hennessy. And you can see the many people behind the scenes that are helping to bring all of this together. 
I just want to remind everybody where you are. You are at the Roosh uh, Center, um, and our mission when it was founded in 2009 was to bring all of the scientific expertise that we had and couple it to that Cura Personalis, Georgetown spirit of a patient-centered philosophy to really bring curative therapies uh, to our patients with GI cancers. And we do it through a series of focus areas of research to cure, engagement and education. And when we talk about our research to cure uh, focus, we really do enjoy investing in high risk, high return kinds of uh, uh, projects. And science is generally incremental, meaning we take one step at a time. We carefully stand on the step we're on, take a risk to get to the next step. And when we see that that's a safe step, we then go from there. And without incremental science, we would not be as smart as we are today. But there are also leaps. I don't know, some of you might take more than one step at a time. Um, and so every now and then we see a chance to take more than one step at a time. And what we try to identify within the Roosh Center are those sort of critical moments when we might be able to leap uh, and make more progress. And we know that we have to do this through a teamwork approach. Our engagement and our connecting and our empowerment is at the core of our heart and our soul. The smarter our patients are, the smarter and more informed they are, the better care they'll get out of us, the better able they will be to help make decisions in a world where we don't have all the answers. And so we want you all to be engaged and uh, a part of what we do. This is um, a Pancreatic Cancer Awareness Month. Uh, a couple of marches ago, we were able to turn Niagara Falls uh, blue. It's probably already blue now. It's probably frozen under snow now, given how much snow they got. Uh, overnight, but uh, we, we really do think it's important to fly our own flag as a collection of very, very common cancers, um, and we work together to do that. And then also, as I mentioned, we're educators. We're educating our peers, we're educating our faculty, our, uh, and we're mentoring all those uh, junior folks who we hope to turn on to this field uh, so that there are more of us in the Army fighting to find cures for GI cancers. We have a series of strategic partnerships throughout the cancer community. And this is just some of our highest level connections uh, that we have. But one area we're particularly proud of is something that we founded and is now spun out to be an independent entity. And these are the GR, GI Cancers Alliance. The second most effective advocacy group on the planet is in fact the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society. That is a bunch of different cancers, but it is one bicycle ride. And so we feel like as GI cancers, we have uh, more power together. And so we formed this alliance so that when we can speak with one voice, we do. And I'm very pleased to have Martha Raymond, who is one of the co-directors of this, uh, uh, as one of our panelists later on this morning. We've had a busy year with a lot of different activities through the year. Some of them are fun, like golf tournaments and 5Ks, but many of them are serious education events. Um, so we want you to participate in as many of these as you wish. Yes, we want your money. We want you to help support uh, the science and the advocacy that we are doing. So any opportunity that you have to participate in these uh, is helpful to all of us, to the community at large. We keep each other informed. If you are interested in receiving a weekly email from us, that, yep, you can delete with the others. Uh, but this is a summary of all of the week's worth of GI cancer science published in the top 30 journals. Um, we put this out on a weekly basis when we get to pick our favorite one of the week. Um, but we hope you find this useful to you, making your world efficient. When you look at the way cancer is being approached, our cancer center is divided into the main sort of corners of this triangle. Cancer prevention and control, understanding who gets it and why. 
cancer host interactions. Once you have a cancer, how does it affect your normal body? What's your normal body's reaction to it? And then what makes cancers tick? That's cancer cell biology. And we have members across our group that are doing all different aspects of this as it relates to GI cancers. And we have formed a recent GI cancers working group uh, to really focus on this. We now have 71 members within our cancer center across 13 departments who have generated eight and a half million dollars of research funding. And we are now putting forward some additional requests for applications for grants um, for those interested in putting together two investigators that had not yet worked together before. New programs for the years ahead, one of our highest priority programs is trying to address the inequities uh, that we see in our society today, uh, particularly around GI cancers. And we have a, a project that we're just beginning with the Colorectal Cancer Alliance and MedStar Health. And we will, it will be the focus of our first uh, breakout sessions uh, topics for this morning around health inequities um, in, uh, in, in our country and how we need to close these gaps uh, for our brothers and sisters uh, who have a more difficult time of navigating the complex world of cancer care. So stick for that. That is coming up in about one minute. Um, I just want to remind everybody what has happened. This will is all on, uh, on record, so you can go back and watch it. So our luminary event, you can see we brought five folks to town and awarded them a Lifetime Achievement Award in GI Cancers. You can see their names there. It was pre, pre, uh, uh, before that was uh, some of our own scientists presenting their, their science. Here's the headshots of uh, those folks who came to town for their uh, awards. Yesterday, as I said, we started with uh, a real deep dive into the science and we looked into targeted therapies, the impact of immuno-oncology, and in specific, this was a real focused area on CAR T cells and how they may have an impact on the treatment of cancer. And then the multidisciplinary approach of the management of GI cancers was our afternoon session. The noon session was about big data and how electronic medical records may, in fact, help us in the cure of cancers. You already know the agenda for today. We just finished focusing in on neuroendocrine cancers, and now we're going to shift over to uh, addressing health disparities, but then following that, fact and fiction around cancer clinical trials and then GI cancer survivorship will get us out in time for a late lunch. So we hope you stay through all of this. It will be recorded if you can't, and you can come back and see it later. For those of you who want to know, our next big cancer meeting is in January. Um, and then right after that, we will be bringing you what we think is the most important data uh, from that. And just to give you a save the date of what's coming, sign up for something fun. Go to Florida for the SOGO meeting, if you're willing to go to Florida. Go to TPC Avenel and play some golf with us. And then our partners at Hope Connections, um, we have their our annual joint summit in July at their beautiful new space. So that's uh, something to look forward to in the year ahead. But before we jump in to our uh, session, we did want to bring you uh, a little bit of why we are here. So if our, our AV people, our tech people can show us our video, please go now. I think the biggest lesson I've learned from my oncology patients is how brave they are. It doesn't matter what age, they face it with such amazing grace. And it's nice to know that they're looking at our staff, be it the nurses, the oncologist, the support staff and saying, even if they don't express it verbally, please help me through this. I need you to be with me. And if I can become part of that team, it's an absolute honor to care for them in that way. <laughs> 